Welcome to our special podcast uh, episode today, exploring the UK biosecurity state and the new normal. I'm delighted to be joined by author, researcher and historian Simon Elmer this evening, who has written countless articles over the last three years, exploring many different dimensions of what's happened in with regards to the pandemic response, looking at the political response, looking at the science, looking at the evidence, uh, and really painting a picture of uh, what underpins what we're experiencing today, the rise of totalitarianism, the road to fascism. These topics we'll unpack this evening as part of this discussion. We're going to look at a number of different angles tonight, looking at the transition from a democratic model of governance to a centralized technocratic model during COVID-19. We're going to look at how the state of emergency as a paradigm of government and the normalization of fear was used to manufacture consent to consensus. And we'll also look at what this new emerging biopolitical paradigm can tell us about what's coming, whether that's digital ID, CBCDs, the central bank digital currencies, or the WHO's own pandemic treaty. And it's it's our hope, at least, and it's my hope, that we can uh, intertwine and perhaps conclude on some acts of resistance, some of the things that we can do right now to tackle what is emerging. So as I mentioned in the introduction, Simon's published numerous articles on the rise of the UK biosecurity state. He's recently published two brand new books uh, on this topic, uh, and you'll see the links to those books in the show notes, in the description, and I strongly encourage you to check those out. But uh, Simon, welcome to the Elevate podcast. I'm delighted to have you here this evening. Hello, Dan. Thanks for having me on here. Gosh, where do we start? You know, the, uh, you, the the volume of work that you've created is is phenomenal. I just want to commend you on the work that you've done over the last couple of years. Um, and, and the kind of framework for tonight's conversation is around the rise of the UK biosecurity state. So I, I would like to kind of explore first and foremost, you know, we've all got our story about how we we came to analyze the, the nuances of what was happening over the last couple of years. What, When and how did you start to realize that there was this emerging UK uh, biosurveillance or biosecurity state. Uh, you know, when, when did you start to look critically at this? I started to look critically at it straight away because I didn't believe what was, well, I was, I was resistant to the regulations that were being imposed on us from, you know, March 2020. Um, and for myself, I started looking at the figures that were coming out of Italy, which we were told we were sort of two, they were two weeks ahead of us. And also, in a lesser extent, what was coming out of China. And they simply didn't match up one with the the propaganda that was coming out of the media, the sort of the fear mongering. It didn't seem to justify in any way um, the kind of tales they were telling us about the seriousness of what we were facing. But the real thing was <clears throat> my innate dislike of being told what to do by the state and governments. Um, and when I started looking at these regulations, again, they had no uh, justification or correspondence to what appeared to be uh, you know, uh, perhaps a severe case of seasonal influenza or comparative to that. Um, I've got a background because I'm head of research at my company, Architects of Social Housing, reading legislation. I'm used to reading ho- housing policy. And I'm lo- used to looking at housing data and seeing the lack of correspondence between that as well. Um, I'm also look- int- uh, used to looking at what financial motivations there are for creating crises. You know, I've been looking at and writing about the housing crisis. Uh, for the last seven years. So when I put that all together and start looking at the figures, looking at the legislation, it didn't seem to add up. The term biosecurity itself, I'm a reader of the um, Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben, who's been writing about uh, biopolitics and the biosecurity state since about 1995. Um, I hadn't really read him for a while, but then exactly two months from the World Health Organization's declaration of the pandemic, which is March 11th, it's just gone by. Yep. Uh, exactly two months from there, the UK uh, government declared the Joint Biosecurity Centre, which was very openly modelled on the Joint um, Terrorist Analysis Centre or something like that, which had been set up, I think, in after 7-7 <clears throat> in the UK. Um, and I thought, hmm, okay, what does this term biosecurity mean? Um, I realised that the Joint part of that was that it was a public-private partnership. And like most public-private partnerships, the private sector of it had a lot more control over it, but the public side of it, that is the government and the state side of it, meant that it had the legislative authority of the UK state. Um, So that was the kind of 
the impetus of me to start looking at this term biosecurity. And since then, it's become one of the explanatory models for me that I've used to try and understand what's been going on. Mm. Could you elaborate on what that kind of encompasses then, if we, if we were to paint a picture of what the kind of biosecurity state um, points to? <laughs> um, okay, let's quite quickly do it. The term biopower, um, as probably a lot of you know, was introduced by the French philosopher Michel Foucault, kind of around the late 70s and 1980s. And he was trying to, <clears throat> he used it to describe a kind of shift in the not the nature of power, but how power is manifest. In the sort of, I guess, if you like, the historical materialist problematic, power is an effect of economic inequality, of laws, of government power, of the state, of you know, all sorts of things like that. Um, it's kind of very intentional. Foucault wanted to use the term biopower to describe a shift from a legislative framework of power being about what you can and cannot do, which is ultimately manifest in the power of the state to punish you if you break its laws, to a different model of power, which is about the management of life. Um, and he calls this a new technology, a new technology of power. And his interest in that was how discourses um, position the human body within um, a set of institutional frameworks and ideas which have financial support and legislative authority. So, <clears throat> you know, you can have a discourse of sexuality, a discourse of criminality, a discourse of policing, of, um, of surveillance, etc., etc., which have their justifications, their institutional basis. Um, so you can see with the enormous shift that we suddenly had, where pretty much all our human rights were removed from us, under these kind of this new wave of legislation that was imposed on the justification of uh, addressing a health crisis. Um, our human rights have been taken away from us and all we had was our biological existence, which had to be defended at any cost, even at the ultimate cost of shutting down the economy for two years, taking away medical care, treatment and diagnosis for, two, for 68 million people in this country for two years locking very vulnerable people in care homes in the you know without any medical attention or visits and so on for two years etc cetera, etc cetera, which has caused you know huge and you know, tens of thousands at least and go on to could be, could be, continue to cause those deaths in the years to come it still sounds every time i recount or hear someone recounting that kind of overview of what went on over the last couple of years is a bad horror movie script that's just gone wrong but unfortunately it's not a script it's it's well you could argue that it was a script um but but it, it uh it's played out in this fashion now how then does this connect with the kind of legislative approach that the governments took over the last couple of years the regulations the protocols the practices how does this fit within this kind of overarching framework of the biosecurity state? Well, there's two things. <clears throat> In the first two years, we had 500, apart from the Coronavirus Act itself, which is kind of vast document, which was sort of waved through government in, a, in less than a week. Um, we had 582 coronavirus justified statutory instruments made into law. And I think 537 of them were made into law before they were even presented to parliament. There was no production of any um, uh, impact assessment or pr proof, production of proof or evidence for the, you know, to justify it. Um, what they did is, as I said, remove our human rights, our rights of movement, of association. And when we moved into the UK, I'll call it vaccination program, because that was the title for it, as we know, it's a gene therapy program. We even lost our right to say what went into our body as well. Um, my interest now, though, is that Foucault says that one of the effects of biopower, as it becomes more dominant as a means of governance, governance which isn't simply from, from the government itself, but much more diffuse, implemented and manifest through the multiple institutions that constitute our society, is that we move away from a legislative framework, this kind of very repressive, or can be oppressive, was very oppressive during the two years of lockdown, into a kind of a technological framework, I'm very interested at the moment, maybe we can talk about that later, that the new technologies of our, <clears throat> let's call it what it is, our enslavement, our, our governance, our, our management, the management of our bodies, like the World Health Organization Pandemic Treaty, which is 
being um, the first draft has just been published, like central bank digital currency, like digital ID, which of course is is based on, or at least was first introduced around the idea of vaccine passports, and like Agenda 2030 with its sustainable de development goals and so on, which has been around since 2015. These are being implemented in the UK as we speak. <laughs> There's kind of these faux consultations on them, and they are in effect are going to place the UK under a a de facto, an unstated, if you like, state of emergency. They're going to make permanent the legal status that we have as citizens without human rights that we had under lockdown. All the regulations that were passed there were, were you know, put forward as temporary measures, uh, including the regulations that, you know, allowed the UK vaccination program to happen. These new treaties, these new agendas, these new technologies, these new programs, um, and also the ideologies around them are going to make that permanent. And that, for, for me, to understand how we've moved from a <coughs> facade of democracy to, to a technocratic form of governance in which these, these programs are going to be, or are being implemented outside of any democratic process and out of any um, process of accountability, and largely without the knowledge of the British people, um, we're going to move from a de democratic model, flawed as it was, into a very openly technocratic model. And by uh, you, it seems to describe how that's happening. Yeah, I would concur. Now, for, for a lot of people, it's felt like it's crept up incredibly fast as a kind of almost consequence of the uh, pandemic response. But I think for, for a lot of people who have began to trace back or previously have experience of tracing back prior to the pandemic, it, it, it seems to be quite clear that some of the warning signs were already there and that the, the response to COVID-19 enabled this kind of pathway to accelerate. What's your take on its um, evolution and, you know, where, where does it begin? You know, a lot of people are asking, you know, uh, what's led us on this path? I'm curious to know your take on that. That is a big question. Um, well, let's... History, you know, doesn't suddenly crack and, and you, you go through quantitative shifts. Um, you know, you could say the one of the ways I've described this um, quite early on is that we're undergoing a revolution in Western capitalism. Western capitalism is sort of global capitalism, but not quite. It certainly affects the globe. Um, but there is there has been, you know, there was the 2008, 2007, 2008 global financial crisis. There was another one that began in September 2019 months before anyone had heard of covid and there's you know there's a lot there's an argument to say that the shutting down of the economy for 2 years was in response to the vast sums the millions and millions trillions sorry that were pumped into the collapsing financial sector um one of the effects is what we've just seen last friday with the crash of the um the silicon valley bank which is not going to be the the last one to crash um so we're definitely going through an enormous crisis of uh financial capitalism in the west the kind of the debt, the debt to GDP level that we've got in the West. In this country, it's something like 298%, but in the US, it's very high as well compared to places like Russia and China. Um, so you could definitely trace this back to the beginning, if you like, of um, the rise of finance capitalism through uh, neoliberal monetary and, finan and uh, uh, financial policies in the late 70s and 80s. More immediately, you could look at something like the rise of... Uh, environmental fundamentalism, um, which is written into the uh, Agenda 2030, which, as I said, was signed, I think, agreed in 2015, so five years before all of this. And I think it's interesting that <clears throat> the language, it was there in the, it was there in the language of environmentalism before the COVID crisis, but there's been a kind of a seamless transition from um, the fundamentalism of the COVID faithful, as I call it, where anyone who questions the government, anyone who questions the media, is called a denier. So there's no platform for discussion at all, no platform to date, no platform for uh, reasserting our rights. That has been seamlessly, that has seamlessly transitioned into environmental fundamentalism there, where we have the same kind of um, language being used, the same lack of debate, the same, you know, for instance, Sadiq Khan, the uh, mayor of London, where I live, uh, last week, you know, described anyone who was opposed to his, uh, what is it, his his, uh, his ULES scheme, the low emission scheme in London, which is going to enclose the entire capital, 
as a COVID denier, as far right, as what else was it? I don't know, coronavirus, uh, a vaccine denier or something like that. So the, I think the environmental fundamentalism, which was written into transnational legislation or international law by Agenda 2030, and its very complex series of um, um, obligations that the signatory nations have, particularly sustainable development goals and environmental, social and governance criteria. These set the tone, if you like, they set the template for what happened under the coronavirus crisis and other manufacturing crisis. Um, and that has, but then the environmental one has come over again. But it's not the last one, is it? You know, we've got the geopolitical crisis in the Ukraine, we've got the energy crisis, we've got the cost of living crisis. This, you know, the, the we are in kind of a crisis capitalism, aren't we? Yeah. So it goes back a long way, but it's a it's a kind of a continuum. And I think hopefully one of the things that people can see coming out of the coronavirus crisis and that kind of fear mongering is that this is a new model of governance, governance by fear. Yeah, uh, and of course you've got the banking crisis on top of that. And, you know, I, I posted just recently on Twitter that, you know, it's crisis after crisis after crisis. You know, there, it's 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 almost like there's one ready package, ready made to follow the last. And it's it is that permanent state of crisis to the to the level that the Collins dick. This is this is this is this is genuine. The Collins dictionary word of the year for 2022 was <laughs> was, was it, it was perma crisis. That, that was their word of the year. It was perma crisis. And, and that's no joke. 2022 word of the year perma crisis. And it feels like we've descended into this. Now, you've mentioned public-private partnerships, the, mm. the kind of centralised te technocratic piece here. Um, now, we've seen, obviously, a large transfer of wealth over the course of the pandemic, and we'll see it again now through the banking crisis, and I'm sure we're seeing it through the geopolitical crisis as well, the military-industrial complex. Mm. You know, a lot of people are talking about the World Economic Forum and their influence and other kind of centralised, non-elected NGO type intergovernmental organizations and the role that they have yeah. in global governance. I think there's a lot to unpack here in terms of what role do you feel these types of institutions or organizations play in the overall architecture of what's happening? Um, you know, do, can we attribute what's happening to some of these players or is there something more broad you know the the rise of totalitarianism is that is that coming from elsewhere what's your take on how this kind of technocratic model is 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 now accelerating it's very interesting the world economic forum i mean i'm not really sure i'd heard of it before this actually i can maybe kind of dimly and stuff and uh certainly in the early days of you know lockdown and all the, the hysteria um anyone who mentioned it you know everyone suddenly became aware of this kind of strange figure called klaus schwab and of this strange term called the great reset it was denounced as conspiracy theory as a lie and stuff and the, someone pointed out actually they've been saying this for a few years on their website and so on um you had kind of people like naomi klein kind of saying anyone who attributes any kind of intentionality or influence to the wef is a conspiracy theorist and stuff like that i think <clears throat> The WF has kind of emerged. It's a think tank, I think, for Western capitalism in the period of its decline. That's the best way I can kind of describe it. Um, it's got a very important role, I think. I'm not sure. I, don't, I wouldn't say it is the you know, most important one or the most powerful institution. There are far more, like the World Bank, like the International Monetary Fund. It's not an institution of power in itself. It is a think tank. The most important thing it did is that in March, again, in March 2020, the same day, 11th of March, that the World Health, sorry, the World Health Organization declared the pandemic. On that very day, the World Economic Forum partnered with the World Health Organization and launched something called the, uh, the, the what is it, the COVID Action Platform. Um, that very quickly, it's obviously been prepared in advance. It got something like 1,200 of the world's most powerful organizations, a large proportion of which were banks or are banks and financial institutions, asset managers, all the usual names you'd expect. Um, the other kind of main uh, components are um, uh, information technology companies, the biggest in the world. And the other one, of course, is uh, pharmaceutical companies. They make up the kind of the, the primary mo mo um, element of it. They've got less industrial producers or things like that, or manufacturers. Um, and this, I think, is the well, I don't think this organization is a kind of a template, a model, particularly in its membership, of what the yeah. W calls stakeholder capitalism. Stakeholder capitalism is 
explicitly about a technocratic form of governance in which we, the people, really don't exist. We have a government which will, will be represented by, again, unelected bureaucrats who go to the WF and talk and so on. But the real prime movers are the CEOs of the companies, the financial institutions, and so on and so forth. Um, and they've been very open about that. Go back to your point, you kind of mentioned the banking crisis. Um, this year, what is it, last month, over the last two months, February and March, it was in February, wasn't it? The WEF had their annual meeting. Um, and they talked about every crisis under the sun. They talked about all the ones we've just named, but there's one that they don't talk about. They don't talk about the financial crisis. Apparently, what they're doing is transition to a world government, which they're very open about uh, talking about, um, a technocratic form of governance. So they make no reference to any kind of democratic process. It's like, we are going to do this. We are going to make this decision. We are going to sign this treaty. We are going to implement these programs and technologies. Um, they always justify it as being responding to an environmental crisis, a health crisis, an energy crisis, a geopolitical one. Yeah. I don't ever mention the real driving crisis of all these, which is the financial one. Because, of course, then people might start saying, hmm, maybe lockdown has another reason. Maybe sustainable development goals aren't about saving the planet from predatory capitalists, but actually it's a way of getting access to the new kind of um, resources in the global south that we need for this kind of transition to, you know, an electric grid and, and so on and so forth. So it is a think tank, but like all think tanks, it's not simply coming up with ideas. It's also promoting them to the public, the Western public, and they've been extremely successful about it. Everyone, it seems, has bought the environmental crisis, and they absolutely refuse, it seems, to look at who are the agents behind it, how sustainable development goals actually work, and how they're going to be used. Yeah, so I think what, to me, stands out is the fact that you've got this enormous corporate power underpinning, uh, and you're right, that the World Economic Forum is one, you know, kind of, great think tank of, of, of some of the largest companies and most affluent individuals and powerful government leaders. But there are many others. And, and of course, there are many major institutions that aren't part of any of these clubs, but still have enormous influence. It, to what extent, and, and I know your first volume was written about the road to fascism. To, could you draw out the kind of distinctions of whether this is a return to fascism with the corporate influence over governments and the rise of totalitarianism and how these two <laughs> intersect or compete? Yeah. Um, the first sort of two years, I wrote analytical articles, which were mostly looking at um, the data around um, you know, what was going on. As I said, the policy uh, the mortality figures, the infection fatality rates and all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> but at some point, I think in late 2020, early 2021, I thought I've got to try and get a sense of you know, kind of what you asked. When did this begin? Where's it going? What exactly are we seeing? Uh, you know, I made reference to this this revolution in Western capitalism. And I thought I've got to try and, try and make a bigger picture of this. Um, and I very deliberately didn't use the word fascism. I thought it was too loaded a term. And I thought... You know, it's for a long time now. It's simply been seen as a, a kind of as an insult. It kind of uh, it, may, it kind of qualifies you as somebody who isn't kind of a serious thinker. So I resisted using it, although I recognise that people, some people, were already using this term to describe what was going on. But then we went into the winter of what was it, twenty one, twenty two. Um, I'd kind of taken a break for a few months to actually do some paid work, um, and over that winter, we we kind of had the full. It never quite materialized, but we had the full threat of vaccine passports. It, they were used, you know, for certain workers, for certain industries and so on. But the, the legislation around their enforcement was terrifying and the way the police were enforcing them as well. So we had the kind of the, the, the appalling scenes that were coming out of Canada when Justin Trudeau kind of quoted every, you know, justification, then sent in what seemed like paramilitaries and police um, to kind of attack these freedom convoys. You had similar things going on in France. In, in Austria, you had people being told that if they didn't, if all the whole population didn't inject themselves with a sufficient number of times, um, that they would be fined or they confined to their home. And if they left, they'd be fined. If they couldn't pay the fine, they would go to jail. And I began to thought, think, if this isn't fascism, what is it? So I began to think about, well, what can fascism not what can fascism, historical fascism, tell us about this moment? 
And historical fascism, particularly in the Third Reich in Germany in the 1930s, had a very biopolitical model of governance. It imposed its legislations, its regulations around a discourse of disease. Um, it wanted to divide people up into the healthy and the unhealthy, the pure and the impure, uh, around a kind of eugenics kind of model. Um, and <clears throat> it, it had an explicitly biopolitical paradigm of controlling people's bodies according to whether they were designated as healthy or not, un not unhealthy. So you had something like, you know, Jews, Jewish children wouldn't be allowed to go to school. But very similar to us, it wasn't simply because they were seen as a vector of disease through their bodies, but their ideas were dangerous as well. And we saw that where people was, people like us who asked questions were told, not only are you dangerous because you're mixing with us without being vaccinated, but your ideas themselves are dangerous to the state. So I thought, well, that's something I, we can look at this. And I've made kind of parallels between the laws passed between 1933 and sort of around about 1939, before the war started, and what was passed in this country. And the parallels are extraordinary. So that was something I looked at as well. But the other thing I looked at, which is also very, not simply particular to the Third Reich, but to what happened in, um, in Italy, which of course was the first fascist government, um, and then spread across all, all over Europe. You know, pretty much all of Europe was living under some form of fascism, or certainly national authoritarianism, was a technocratic form of governance in which the interests of um, business, international businesses, um, and the interests of government merged. Um, and you had fascism, I think, is peculiar or particular to Europe, and fascist states rise on failing democracies. And what we were seeing under COVID was a completely failed democracy. And we were seeing this enormous shift in power away from democratic institutions or institutions which function democratically and were accountable to the public, at least in principle, to completely cloak and dagger stuff. You know, vast, vast amounts of the duties and authority of the state were and have been handed over to international corporations, or it doesn't matter whether they're international or, 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 or national. Um, and that is continuing apace. And all the sort of uh, programs that we're seeing implemented now, like CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency, like the WHO Treaty, like Digital ID, and like Agenda 2030, is continuing that transition, that trans, uh, is that the right word, transition of power and accountability away from a, a the, the nation state as the primary form of uh, government that we've lived under for five, six hundred years into a international technocracy. So in that sense, looking at fascism, historical fascism, it wasn't saying that we had necessarily returned to it. We obviously live in a very different world. Um, the ideology, if you're right, has changed in certain respect, although the fear mongering, the hate and the um, ostracization of its sectors of society certainly hasn't changed. Um, but it has something to tell us about this. So I began to use this term, and I call my book The Road to Fascism, because that's definitely where we're heading, if we haven't got there already. Yeah, so I think uh, when people think of fascism, I think they almost immediately revert to kind of dictator-like figures yeah. uh, overarching a nation, typically, and maybe using that power in a certain ways, uh, maybe to extend their power beyond the nation. Um, <laughs> But then you have this concept of totalitarianism, which Matthias Desmond has spoken about with our audience here and, and on the podcast and offers a kind of related, but, but also in some ways different view on how this is manifested on a global level without such a dictator type figure. Yes. How, how do you relate the two concepts? Well, you know, one of my guides through, because uh, I write a lot of my book about, that's kind of the end goal, if you like, of fascism, which is totalitarianism. And certainly um, one of my guides has been the German political theorist, Hannah Arendt, who wrote her book, you know, The Origins of Totalitarianism. And that's been very instructive. When I was reading it, it was like, this, you know, it was such a good description of our present. Um, I don't think all fascism has become totalitarian, but it seems to me absolutely incontrovertible, but that... The, the goal of this global government, of this world government, which is being formed, which is <clears throat> made up of different global technocracies. The World Health Organization is one. The, um, the World Economic Forum is another. 
um, central bank digital currency will give the, the you know the inter the bank of international settlements which is a the kind of the, the the central bank of the 63 central banks of the world which kind of control about 92 percent of the global gdp that's going to be another one um sorry what was your question again about oh yeah um sorry say it again so, so how yeah I, I kind of relayed how people perceive fascism and uh, almost a uh, dictator-like approach. Yeah. yeah, we've got this globalized... Yeah, totalitarianism uh, is different to a dictator. Um, a dictatorship, this is why I think we, when we, we're definitely moving or have moved or on the cusp of moving into a totalitarian system of governance. Dictatorship is very much top down. It's a form of tyranny. And in a way, it's never going to work. It's never going to last, if you like. It will last for a few a few years. Because to have a functioning society and also a productive society, the people in it have to be on board. They have to be productive. You have to have a kind of a working model. Um, totalitarianism is a different one. That's when the the surveillance, the uh, the violence, the hatred, um, the um, the technologies of governance that I kind of talk about don't come from the top. They come from down up. And you know what we saw in this country and across the West is that people were very, 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 very willing, eager, even happy, even, to denounce their neighbor, to ostracize people who didn't comply, um, to spy on them. Um, there was a kind of a complete, there has been still a complete transition from critical thought and values of freedom and democracy, kind of fundamental values, even if they're not actual realities in Western societies, to a completely different model. Um, and the new technologies that are coming in now have, I think, an explicitly totalitarian um, uh, endgame, if you like. Mm. Uh, totalitarianism is based on the isolation of people from each other, the distrust between them, um, in isolating and making people lonely. And if we think what we're kind of doing to our kids, I think we are undoubtedly preparing a totalitarian future for children who are being indoctrinated into very different values than the ones that we were with when we grow up. Freedom is no longer the principal value in our society. Other values are like safety. Um, obedience to the state has now become the highest civic virtue. Um, so there's, there has been a fundamental, there is we're undergoing a fundamental change in our values. And I think that's what totalitarianism is about. It's not simply about the governance or the laws. It's about how people think about the world they live in, their own political agency or lack of it, and how they feel about each other as well. So in that respect, I think the fear, um, <clears throat> but also the virtue signaling, if you like. Um, you know, um, in the French Revolution, um, uh, Robespierre kind of, you know, talked about during a revolutionary period, the virtues of, uh, sorry, the, um, the principles of government must be both virtue and terror. On the one hand, we're terrorized into compliance, but on the other, we're rewarded for our compliance. You know, that term virtue signaling is, is very well used. Um, and still today, there are people who see compliance with vaccination uh, mandates or masking or social distancing or no doubt digital ID when it comes in. And I'm sure the WHO treaty as well as a form of virtue as well. We have to remember that, you know, I think because of the sort of the Holocaust industry, the kind of uh, it's created this image of the 1930s of, of fascism as all about jackboots um, and concentration camps and all the terrible things that came out of it. And that was there, but it was also a great a time of great renewal and hope. Um, but like all unity, social unity is predicated on who is not in that unity. It's a kind of a closed circle. And if you're outside of it, you're nowhere. And that is a very strong model, which has kind of come out of nowhere and has been embraced appallingly by people who originally or initially or previously valued things like freedom, uh, debate, um, freedom of expression and thought and so on. And that seems to have all gone out the window. Yeah. So just to pull together some of the strands that are coming up for me as we as you go through this is I think there's a kind of highly collectivized ideology that's underpinned by a moral absolutism in a way. And I see that there's this almost hijacking of moral authority by these technocrats, um, you know, where historically we may have uh, collectively developed our moral norms through other institutions, whether it's education, family unit or religion, 
it, it almost feels that these these centralized authorities have now hijacked that and as a result people have associated you know the virtue of complying with these moral absolutes yeah yeah is is kind of almost creating this blind compliance it's not almost clear it's, we've seen it create that blind compliance and to me that's where it gets really tricky because trying to understand things from an ideological perspective and how people become kind of blindsided by what's going on is in many ways in my view the kind of key to understanding this is 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 how how does that unfold what's your, what's your take on that kind of adoption of moral absolutism yeah it's um I mean, a number of people have kind of asked me, do you see this as a product of the decline of, um, you know, a national identity or the decline of religion as a, as a you know, which I've never thought of as a positive force. Um, but, you know, the, the fact that there isn't something binding us together as a, as a nation or as a people, uh, as a population, at least, um, <clears throat> that the technocrats and the, uh, the globalists and the ideologues of Kind of come into that vacuum and filled it with something else. Um, the um, yeah, you've called it absolutism. I call it sort of fundamentalism. Fundamentalism is that everything is a literal truth. So nowadays, if you say something, there is no interpretation of it. like, for instance, not I'm a defender of him, but Gary Lineker's kind of comparison between uh, you know the the effects of the you know the, uh, the illegal immigration bill, migration bill. Um, and the discourse around 1930s. Now everyone took that absolutely literally and said, oh, you're comparing this to Nazi Germany or something like that. Strangely enough, I was, my company was investigated by the Architectural Registration Board and by um, the overseers of kind of, you know, in, um, uh, uh, companies, um, because in my early articles, I did exactly the same thing. And that itself, and I said, and I kind of wrote back to them and said, I'm a historian, when did it become illegal we were being threatened with not being able to practice anymore and huge fines and stuff when did it become illegal to make historical comparisons between places that itself is a characteristic of fundamentalism the words have this kind of literal sense and a lot of the um the way the media whether in the uh, the mainstream media or on social media drums up the population into frenzies of fear and hatred is um through this um through this fundamentalist approach to speech and expression. So as you know, there's a huge number of laws and regulations and, and legislation coming in, which is going to um, determine how we can speak. It's a very important point. People think, uh, <clears throat> Roland Barthes wrote about this many years ago, people think about fascism as an interdiction. Fascism says what you cannot say, it doesn't. Fascism tells you what you must say. And at the moment, there's a whole series of new ideologies, new discourses, particularly around things like gender, um, sexuality, um, uh, medicine, in which you are obliged to pretty repeat, if you like, the mantras of those in power. Um, so yeah, I think, I also think the last thing I want to say about that is social media, because I was talking before about how <clears throat> these new ideologies, these new relations, these new ways and practices that we adopt are not coming through regulations necessarily, but they're also being affected through the implementation, implementation of these new technologies of governance. I don't think any of this could have happened without social media. You mm. need that permanent access to the minds and the bodies of the British public as, as across the West that social media gives you. When people are constantly you know, wedded to their, their mobile phone and they're constantly being terrorized or told to, um, to ostracize someone or to join the latest protests or whatever, you're kind of constantly within the um, institutional power of fundamentalist thought. Um, you know, the rise of woke ideology, for instance, which is a, I think, a completely fascist ideology. It's no platforming, it's kind of demands for compliance and, de and demonstrations of virtue signaling, um, is a fundamentalist ideology where you have to constantly repeat you know there's no there's no politician now who can't who could possibly get into power if they didn't state that um a man who says he's a woman is a woman that's become a kind of a an unnegotiable sort of statement so the, there has been a rise of what did you call it moral absolutism and then there's, there's nothing that makes people there's nothing that terrifies more people more than a threat to their life and there's nothing that makes people feel better than themselves than moral rectitude 
Mm. And yeah, and these things then, you know, combined with the state of emergency and the overarching fear that comes from the kind of perma crisis has led to compliance cons- and this illusion of consensus. It's and we've been exploring this within our community around this idea of self censorship. And you're right; it's it's you're told what you can say, but then it becomes very difficult to say the things that you supposedly shouldn't say, uh, which are, are are in many cases the things that need to be said. Um, and that creates a really tricky environment because it limits any kind of counter cultural resistance to to that because people become self censored in mm. regards to these moral absolutes yeah um i mean one of the things i've written about my book is this 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 concept of the state of emergency you know, we lived most of europe actually declared a formal state of emergency under european law um which of course allows you to basically um lift people um, ignore people's human rights it allows you to give vast sums of money to individual projects and so on if you know if someone says well i'm going to produce lots of uh um you know medical pandemic you know products or something like that you can give them loads of money so <clears throat> we lived under that again in a, in a through a temporary period you know the coronavirus act was specifically stated at the start to be for two years and i remember i, I was amongst many of us who were like why is it going to go for two years if we're going through a you know, respiratory virus which become endemic pretty soon. And it went for exactly two years. You know, they knew what they were doing. The new um, the new technology and the new programs which are being implemented now, um, the way that another thing we can learn from the historical fascism is the rise of the camp as a biopolitical paradigm of the state. Agamben says that the camp is the permanent spatialization of a state of emergency. When you're in the camp, you don't have human rights, you effectively live under a state of emergency, and the people who control the camp can do anything they want with you. The extreme case of that in contemporary world is Guantanamo Bay, where the people in there haven't even been accused of anything. They are completely outside of any law, criminal law, US law, international law, um, the kind of the various treaties that the US has signed are completely irrelevant there because they are in a state of emergency. All their rights have gone. And we saw that happen in the UK, for instance, in the way we treated people in care homes, which is where the greatest number of deaths um, actually happened in that first year, you know, at least 20,000, probably a lot more, where people were taken into the care homes, they were denied medical care, they were locked in their rooms, um, they were not allowed to be visited by their um, their family and friends and so on. And unsurprisingly, given that 70% of people in care homes have dementia, they died off in vast numbers. Um, that's a kind of a model of the camp. And we've seen camps in places like Australia, where anyone going in had to kind of go into those quarantine camps. We saw it most in, in the greatest scale in China, where they're building those vast camps. But the way that I understand the use of the camp is that the state itself, the biosecurity state, is going to be coextensive with the limits of the camp. 15 minute cities which are being imposed now as a on the justification that we're going to reduce emissions from cars and make people remain within their limits their kind of 15 minute grazing ranges if you like that's where it's going to start the same way that we were just going to flatten the curve for a couple of weeks as well um what we're doing is we're going to take away people's rights their freedoms of movement which in a sense is the essential um, Hannah Arendt says that freedom of movement is the kind of the basis of all other freedoms as themselves. When the UK, when the global biosecurity state, which will be divided up in different states, is under the WHO treaty, is under CBDC, is under digital ID and future treaties and stuff, we will effectively be living in a camp which will be the social space of the biosecurity state. That's the best way to think about what the biosecurity state is. It's a camp which is coextensive with the state that you live in. Um, so I think the model of a state of emergency and what they did to us and how they justified that is the same way they're going to make that permanent. COVID was the temporary test case, um, but it's not going to stop there. Well, you painted a beautiful picture, Simon, I have to say. We're in a digital room. It's like the, the oxygen's been sucked out of the room. You know, I feel, I feel like... Um, the heaviness I feel of just even exploring that thought, uh, and it's not just a thought because we can see the mechanisms in in progress. Um, 
yeah, it, it makes I could feel my breathing becoming shallower because of the tension that this idea brings to me. Um, but I, so so I think we should shift to look at you know acts of resistance and solutions. And I'm curious to know historically as whether there's any hope in history. You know, certainly we've seen the fall of fascist regimes. We've seen the fall of totalitarian regimes. But, but but what we're facing now in the global nature of it and the mechanisms, the things that you've described, the digital IDs, the central bank digital currencies, to the point where, you know, I said earlier on, it feels like a dystopic movie script. Yeah. It, it almost feels like with the successful implementation of some of these vessels, these mechanisms, that it, there will come a time where people don't even realize they're in that spatial environment that you described that it, it becomes so normalized that you don't recall a free alternative uh and I, and I know people who have left china who it took leaving china to recognize the very nature of the oppression that they were under yeah so once it becomes all encompassing at a global level like that and it comes normalized what's the prognosis at that point because it, you're no longer even thinking about the alternative and, and and the freedoms we once had. Yeah, I think it is concerning. I I think I think I think the the end game of this is our children. I think our children are being brought up, and will when they become um, when they become adults, the values that we have, the ones that are kind of describing freedom of speech, of expression, of movement, of association, of ideas, um, <clears throat> of humanity with each other of the human being as the kind of the ultimate uh, foundational value of our society, of democracy, et cetera, et cetera, of transparency, um, of knowledge and investigation, they're not being brought up to value those. They're brought up with completely different values. Um, and I think the end game of this is the world that they're going to be having is one which we wouldn't recognize and they won't remember this world because they're too young. That's why I think it's very important that those of us who are old enough to remember what that freedom was, what that relative freedom was. Freedom is always a relative concept, that we not only fight this, but we continue to hold on to the um, the documents, if you like, or the practices, the behaviours of that freedom. It's very important that with all the moments of resistance or non-compliance or civil disobedience that we can act, which can be individual ones, which can be collective ones, which can be social ones, that we remember that we are demonstrating to others and to each other, and particularly to young people, these values, to hold on to them. You know, um, <clears throat> there is a fundamental failure within totalitarianism. It, oh, it's a failure, it's a fault within it. Totalitarianism is whose ultimate goal is to render human beings redundant to its functioning as a system of governance. It wants to get rid of them. And we can see that, you know, when central bank digital currency comes in, if it does come in, if it is implemented, and we have to resist it with everything we've got, we don't need a judiciary. We don't need a legislator to make um, to make uh, regulations. We don't need a judiciary. If you fall foul of the programs, the conditions of expenditure of use, of use which will be written into that, you won't be able to use it. You won't have access to everything we need because well, there'll be no means of exchange. Um, so it's rendering our judgment as human beings and laws, our consensus-based sense of society, completely irrelevant. Now, <clears throat> I've still got some faith, despite the last three years, in human beings, the people here. The fact I'm looking at you now, we're having these conversations. Um, I've met a lot of new people who I wouldn't have met before over this. You know, we haven't gone into it. Maybe we cut a little bit, but the whole left-right divide has been shown to have absolutely no explanatory purchase or um, a model of resistance on what's been happening, and that's broken down barriers which have divided us from each other for a very long time. I've got hope in human beings, and I think because totalitarianism is about erasing the human being, the transhuman programs we're seeing promoted by the WEF this dystopian image of the future, which I just painted for you, which was so dark, is not somewhat something that anyone could possibly want unless they have been raised by a series of apocalyptic threats, which is our children. They have been raised on austerity, on national decline, 
on banking crises, of environmental crises, of health crises. They graduated to lockdown, they graduated to mask and vaccine mandates. They have been bombarded with fear and trans, and they're being offered as a way out of that explicitly. Like, explicit. This is a ridiculous sale, as you say. Um, but he, he, he's been the one that they look to for me to open up. Sorry, the Simon, we just that sounds like a match of the day, I think, doesn't so it? A match of the day <laughs> kicked in there. Yeah, we'll have to edit that out. That's <laughs> <laughs> right. So and they're being offered as a way out of this kind of terror, these transhuman programs. And that's why I think it's up to us. One of the things we can do, despite all the kind of the more explicit resistances, is to reaffirm the human being. Um, I think one of the things we can do is... <clears throat> propose and draw and create and paint a different future to the one we're being offered. Because the one we're being offered is literally a concentration camp. It's a digital camp in which we will be completely controlled and which will effectively eradicate everything which is endemic to the human being. Um, chance, our randomness, our love of each other, our, our sociability, all these are being explicitly repressed and made impossible. So, you know, someone said to me the other day, you know, what's the point of going on marches? I hope those marches come back. You know, the great marches that we had in the spring and summer of 2021 against uh, passports and vaccine mandates, and particularly for children, got a lot of people out on the streets. Um, they said, what's the point of doing it when they don't get reported in the press? They get you know, described in the media at best as a few hundred right wing conspiracy theorists. We get ignored in Parliament and the government uses it to justify taking even more of our rights away. The most important thing, a march of half a million people or more through London or anywhere else in the country, is that it is a model of a future community, a community where people are not afraid of each other. They haven't masked their faces, which is the most human part of us in terms of our communication, in which we haven't injected ourselves with gene therapies, which are changing our DNA. So, you know, they introduce DNA sequences into our cells, um, in which we're not scared of each other, in which we are being at our most human. We really need to promote that model of a future community and explicitly challenge that to this dystopian future being promoted by place, places like the WF and the WHO. So I think that's the biggest thing we can do. There's lots of ways we can break that down into individual acts of compliance. We need, in Western society, back in the 20s and 30s, there was this thing called communism. And people kind of saw it as a utopian project kind of know where it went for lots of different reasons, but there was at least a utopia. There was something that people had a hope of bringing in. In the West, we haven't had that for a long time. We've had nothing like it. That's gone. And we need one now. We need a different, we need a different vision of a community that people can get behind. And I think now's a really good time to do it. I think the horror, the, the, the terror that we've been subjected to over the last few years actually makes the UK population, population of the whole West, but let's just say the UK, more ready to question the um, question capitalism for a start, what it's produced, but also question this horrible um, society that capitalism has created, the one that was so easily turned against itself. We need to rediscover our humanity and create a future community out of that. Yeah, I certainly agree with the idea that we need a brighter and bolder vision for tomorrow. Uh, and similarly, I also see the value of the demonstrations. You know, I think people almost have false expectations over what a demonstration will do, a rally or a protest. It, it's very rare in the course of history that a single protest will change a policy or a piece of legislation or overthrow a dictator. But to me, it, it is that mass show of courage you know and it's it builds solidarity connection it shows you you're not alone it validates that you know you aren't crazy that you you see what others see and those single acts of courage in a world where we talk about and are dominated by safe spaces you know we, we actually are able to create courageous spaces where new it's idea new ideas and conversations can emerge um and we also have lived through a time where institutions and academia and government have kind of been dominated by linear thinkers rather than lateral thinkers. And it's, you know, in order to get to that creative state of mind, we need some more lateral thinking. You know, we need this kind of critical thinking combined with creative thought in order to use our creative faculties to imagine a more beautiful world that we know in our heart is possible to use the words of Charles Eisenstein. And, uh, and those creative instincts are amplified and multiplied when we connect with one another so 
I think those bridges that are built cross fractions as well. You're, you you noted the political element. That's been the most beautiful thing for me. And our Elevate community is a reflection of it. We've got people of every political leaning here um, who are coming together for a common concern over the state of our world, but also a shared hope for a bolder, brighter, more connected sense of humanity moving into the future. My other hope as a new father, I've got an 18-month-year-old son and you know, he he must have by osmosis overheard all of the 500 plus <laughs> podcasts that I've done over the last few years whilst he was uh, <laughs> my wife's uh, womb <laughs> because he's come out rebellious. He's a clear rebellious yeah. spirit. And I think I look back to myself as a teenager. And it's like we have this generational pushback upon, you know, uh, and we've got a whole generation here. And I really hope that the next wave of young people growing up who who are the children and the grandchildren of, of of people like you and I on this call will see what we see and say you know what this ain't our future and and but we can't leave it to that they're still growing up Zach's eighteen months old you need you know <laughs> we need at least teenagers to, to get onto the case so so the big question Simon becomes in, in kind of closing you know what what if you were without getting into necessarily the nuances of the specific tactics, you know, what are some of the broad themes or strokes or solutions that we can consider? You know, what, what are some of the broader solutions that we can, <clears throat> the broad strokes that we need to think about in your view? Um, there's individual non-compliance, there's collective civil disobedience. Um, one of the things I talk about in my book is what I call the politics of friendship. Um, friendship was directly attacked, you know, um, attacked under lockdown. It still is. We were encouraged to see people as a threat, a form of denunciation, or a form of infection or contagion. Um, as you said, one of the functions of marches is I met loads of people on those marches who would split from their husbands or wives or their children over this, and I think that indicates that there is a there is a politics of friendship. Hannah Arendt talks about, nowadays we tend to think of poly- as friendship as a kind of an intimate space, a place where we share details about our private lives. Um, Hannah Arendt says in ancient Greek, poly- the friendship was a space of discourse. It was a space where you talked not just about each other, but about the world out there. And again, one of the things which was made forbidden, which was still is forbidden to speak about now, is these enormous changes. You know, I'm, I'm getting old now, and I've never seen changes like this in my life, anything close to it. And yet we are told... We can't discuss it. It still just staggers me. I have lost a number of friends, quite a lot of friends over this, because they refuse to discuss what is going on. So I think we need to claim our right as not just as not just as rights as citizens, but as thinking political beings who have had our politics taken away from us, the right to discuss this, exactly what we're doing here. Um, so I think the politics of friendship means. Um, not merely reclaiming our humanity, but reclaiming the space in which we can get together and assert our right to discuss what is going on and say, hold on, you're not going to do this unless we give you some sort of consensus over this. Um, Can I end on something very, very little kind of practical? I brought this up at the weekend when I was doing my book launch and it it went down like a Led Zeppelin. Um, (laughs) I was in the room and I said, I said, um, you know, how many people in this room have a smartphone? I said, let's make it easy. Is there anyone in the room who doesn't have a smartphone? And not a single hand went up. Except for, my, except for myself, of course, this is my Nokia. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of pointed out that how um, central bank digital currency, digital ID, um, all these new technologies, um, the way that 15-minute cities are going to work, the way that the um, obligations of the WHO Treaty, all this stuff initially is going to go through your smartphone. It's all going to go through that. Maybe one day it will start going into implanted chips and stuff. But the point I was trying to make is I kind of said to everyone, knowing all this, do you want to put down your smartphone? Do you want to get rid of it? And everyone was like, are you mad? And I said, I invited them to think about this addiction to technology the same way that so much of this couldn't have happened unless we were addicted to social media, the mass of the people are addicted to social media so that they could be controlled all the time through these technologies. The phone is now part of our psychology, if not yet quite our biology. Um, Yet there is a basic truth. It's a hypothetical truth, unfortunately. 93% of the UK population owns a smartphone. If half of that got rid of it now, picked it up, dropped it into their beer, and never bought another one, most of this would end. They'd have to find a completely way different way to do it. Um, when I said this, I thought it was a natural idea, but people <laughs> didn't like it. And I think that is very important. 
these the, the smartphones are not tools they're not instruments they're not convenience although they're all that they are the tools of our of our of our of our of our um of our slavery and our own enslavement what i said is that the the digital prison the digital camp this camp whose entrance is digital id and which will be surrounded by central bank digital currency this digital camp in which they want to imprison us is literally in our hands and we need to get rid of them that would be the first thing i was going to say if we can't even do that i think you know we're not really at the races so i'd encourage everyone here to get rid of your smartphone get an a to z you know i kind of made a big long list of all the things that it compiles if it is an instrument if it is about convenience all those things can be bought independently and carried around with you but it's not the fact that it's got a phone on it and a video recorder or your music all that that's not what i'm concerned about i'm concerned about that all those things have made us addicted to a technology whose real purpose whose real purpose is about to come online and we need to get rid of them right now Mm, yeah, I, it's it is such a tricky one because I've seen that response elsewhere as well, and even where people have said, "Right, I'm going to do it," like then they, they don't do it. I have, I, you know, I haven't done. Yeah. It's but here's where it gets interesting, I suppose, as a technological solution to a technological problem or a technocratic tech te- a technocratic technological problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, we we've just launched a new show as part of Elevate Media called the Uncharted Territory Podcast, and. We're looking a lot of the kind of emerging decentralized finance elements in yep. particular as a headline piece, as a counterbalance to the centralized finance. Yep. But as part of that, there's a whole new wave of decentralized technology, decentralized mobile phones, decentralized internet networks. You know, there's now, because if you think about the internet in the UK, there's just a handful of network providers. You know, there's loads of, uh, uh, you can use different phone networks and different inter- ISPs, internet service providers, but they all basically play off the same network. Yep. But there's now new decentralized networks emerging. You know, yep. so 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 a lot of these things will have the possibility. Of course, there's going to be a clampdown and a regulation, but in the interim, before that occurs, it's almost like having your cake and eating it. So that you know, you can still use your phone and everything that comes with it, but in a decentralized fashion. And even now, on on the in, in, uh, you know, using the Brave web browser for instance you know it looks and feels like chrome it's got all of the sp- in fact it's faster leaner more efficient than chrome uh which is still the number one you know most used browser in in uk and western europe but uh brave has all of that functionality but it's decentralized so there's there is a you know the, the old song that said the revolution will not be televised you know the revolution will be decentralized you know yeah. this this is where i hold other hope but but i also counterbalance that yeah, there there is a utopian line of thought where this de- de- decentralized technologies could go, yeah. but I also count about the realities of the threat that that poses to the incumbent system. Yeah. And the other thread is, to a degree, we just need to disconnect and get back to a simpler life form that isn't so hyper wired and hyper connected, and just reconnect on a local basis. Get back to nature. Start, you know, living a more primal life in a way, uh, because you know it's our overly consumerist, always on behavior that has just enabled this highly mechanistic, technocratic style of totalitarian governance to emerge. You know, we've enabled it. We've totally enabled it. We can point the fingers outside ourselves, but at the same time, we're not, you know, we're not free from blame. So I think. My think, view on this, and, whether, and I'll hand back to you, is, it's, it's about taking back personal responsibility, you know, in a way. I agree. And I also think there's there's no sort of one, I think when people say, what can we do about this? They kind of Sometimes it feels like they're looking for someone to pluck the rabbit out of the hat. It's like, oh, great, that's it. It's not going to be that. There's, you know, this is a war. It is a civil war. It's, you know, under fascism, you kind of have, you know, the, the fascist states against the Axis and all that sort of stuff. Um, this is a war of governments against their own people. And there is not going to be any single victory, but there has to be forms of resistance. Um, I absolutely agree with you that forms of, it's going to be very hard to get people to give up technology. Technology in itself is neither good nor bad. It's how it's programmed, how it's used. Smartphones, the way they're being used now, which are on a, a central um, a central network, are an absolute tool of the enemy, if you like, the enemy of humanity. And they need to be get rid of. 
But if you can decentralize it, yeah, that'd be great because we also know that they're a great tool for communicating an organization, you know, what we're doing right now. You know, last night I was at a talk with a Bitcoin group talking about to them about central bank digital currency and what I've kind of been researching on that. Um, it's a new article that I've written, which if you don't know about central bank digital currencies, maybe you can put it in the link. I've also done another one, another one on the WHO Treaty. They're both truly terrifying as well. And we would talk afterwards in the discussion, we we're saying, well, how can Bitcoin, for instance, resist this? And I don't think anyone thought it was an absolute kind of solution, but it was a form of resistance. Um, if there is a form of decentralized internet, Christ, we need to get on it, stuff like that. Um, so decentralization is not a solution, but it is definitely a form of resistance. And like all wars, there is no ultimate victory. There's just a long defeat, perhaps. But at least we've got to make it as hard as possible for them to do it. Um, and, you know, the, the the kind of the response that you were kind of talking about, and I was describing in this room, when you say to people, you know, technology is bad, we, you know, I kind of agree to an ex I do agree with your sense that part of our, um, part of the merger, as Klaus Schwab says, of our biological and our digital existences into this new kind of cyborg is definitely a bad thing. Um it's going to be very hard to say to people we need to reverse the clock on technology. I think it's more about being aware of how this technology is being used, how digital ID and CBDC and so on is going to be used, how smartphones are going to be employed, and people making judgments about that and setting up decentralized forms of using them. So you still use the technology, but you don't allow it to be used against you, which is kind of the history of technology, isn't it? But yeah. Yes, and decentralized governments, uh, gov governance, you know, so we can reclaim localized power so it doesn't end up in this kind of highly centralized technocratic form where it's imposed uh, in this kind of way that has been articulated within this discussion. Yeah. Simon, this has been fascinating. We, we have to, I'm cautious of another Rogan esque uh, extended uh, conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I have been, I've been even watching the time, but it's just, it's just you know, yeah. there's, there's a trajectory here. So th thank you um, for sharing your uh, analysis of uh, the various um, forms of governance that have arisen and, you know, the, the, the forms and mechanisms this is undertaking and, and the prognosis, whilst bleak, of what it may lead to in the absence of resistance. You've also uh, given uh, hope in terms of, you know, the fact that uh, when we come together, we rise and we're able to... Um, find a new way to create a public space and form new ideas and solutions that's where uh, courageous spaces emerge for for conversations like this so i want to conclude by just giving you the opportunity to share a little bit about your uh, latest books and where people can find them uh, i think they're, a, they're they're an incredible resource to expand upon this conversation that we've had today so would you just tell us a little bit about those latest two books that you've released and, and where people can, can yeah. get access to those okay this was this was the first book the road to fascism which i i published last september um and all these books, I, I kind of wrote to some publishers, and of course uh, I, I didn't get really much of a response because I mean, you know, one of one of the what's happened here is that you know, just as our parliament's been taken over in our education industries and our governments, so so has our publishing industry. So, but our company publishes our work on architecture and social housing and so on. So we this is self-published ourselves. It's published independently, as it were, and you can it's you can purchase it as a book on demand through um, a printer if you, the link that you'll be putting up hopefully um, that will take you to the ways you can buy it's available in hardback paperback but also as an ebook as well if you if you prefer that um, it did very well kind of relative you know for, a, for an independently published uh, book so I then as you said went back and I made a selection from the articles the sort of two dozen articles I wrote in the uh, first two years of this um, and I've made a selection from them and published them in two volumes the first one called Virtue and Terror, and the other one called The New Normal. Um, this is These are kind of documenting what happened. There's been a lot of, I, there was a number of reasons I wanted to publish these. One of the key ones was we've had a lot of people sort of saying, oh, I was never in favor of lockdown, or we didn't know what lockdown would do, or we didn't know what the gene therapies would do. I went through this, I wasn't the only person who did this, of course, but there's a lot of independent uh, researchers. We went through, we looked at the effects of lockdown and what they would in, in countries where they weren't being implemented, uh, imposed. We looked at the um, the danger signals, the warning signals from the vaccine, uh, the, the, the vaccination programs 
in the UK and across the world. Um, we looked at the dangers of <clears throat> um, of the regulations that were being made and where they could lead to and how it was changing it. We looked at all of this, and this is a document that for those of us who did look, we knew that this was going to happen. And those now claiming that they didn't know, whether that's Chris Whitty saying, oh, I didn't realise removing healthcare for two years would kill tens of thousands of people. Or people saying, well, we didn't know these gene therapies were going to be dangerous, but we had to do it because they, you know, we had this terrible pandemic. These are lies. And these, these books, in a sense, hold them to account. So they're kind of a historical document of what happened in those first two years. And I've also updated, I put a long introduction, which kind of updates them to what's going on now. And particularly what I mentioned before, this transition out of COVID fundamentalism into environmental fundamentalism, and also what's going on in the Ukraine as well. So if you're interested, last thing I'll say, a few weeks ago, Roald Dahl had his books rewritten. Um, <clears throat> that is, you know, we're right back in 1984 now, where he who controls the present controls the past and the past controls the future. Um, I think when the online safety bill comes in, we're not going to, social media will no longer be a, a vehicle, a platform, a forum where we can discuss these sort of things. And I think eventually they will go back and rewrite, not Roald Dahl, but history. They'll rewrite the history of what happened over the last three years. I've got a fear, an expectation that the stuff that I publish on websites, my own website and other ones, will simply not be allowed anymore. They'll get to WordPress or whoever it is. Um, that's the extreme end. Books can't be rewritten. They can be burned. And as they are in the Ukraine, if they're written by a Russian author, they can be turned into toilet paper. They can do pulps and stuff. But if you've got the book in your hand, you've got that object. And I think it's very important, kind of what you were saying, getting away from the virtual world, the digital world, this substitute world, and going back to the actual object. So I think books are kind of a form of freedom at the moment. And that's not just me plugging it. I think I'm sort of going around. <laughs> buying the books that I want to have. Because one day, a lot of that information is simply going to be taken offline, I think. Yes, I think you could be right. And uh, interesting enough, one of our community members suggested that we should take all of the pandemic podcast episodes and create time capsules by putting them on USB discs, uh, drives, and just sending them out to our audience to say, keep hold of this as your time capsule, you know. Um, yeah, I, think, I think that's a very, yes, I think we actually, this is what we're kind of looking at, the rewriting of... You know, history has history. History is a text, and it's constantly being rewritten. And um, you know, the, the the international technocracies that we've got now. One of the things in the WHO treaty, the World Health Organization treaty, is specifically about censoring any sort of disinformation and misinformation. And it actually says in the treaty to make us have confidence in our governments. Um, that's going to involve a lot of rewriting of what's happened. So books are a form of freedom once you've got them in your hand. Absolutely. Make sure you grab a copy of the books. You can find them at architectsforsocialhousing.co.uk. We'll, we'll include the specific links to the books that Simon's referenced in the notes. So look out for those uh, and do take a read of the uh, articles on his website. Uh, it's just such a powerful compendium of uh, resources uh, to support all of these types of conversations that we're having here. So Simon, thank you so much for being part of this powerful conversation. Um, this has been such a, an insightful uh, discussion and it's it's so important that more and more people understand the true nature of what's underpinned uh, the COVID response and, and where that's now leading us. So thank you so much for your wisdom here on the Elevate podcast. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed talking to you, Dan.